Welcome back to Diary of an Empath. So I'm going to jump right in. Today's episode is something that I have been researching for myself. And I think that it will help anybody who is trying to navigate relationships and dating. And if you're trying to learn more about yourself and be better in relationships and how you navigate communication, then this episode is not one to miss. My guest today is an expert in the field of attachment theory. She has compiled years of research and expertise in her new book, The Anxious Hearts Guide. So please welcome Ricky Close. Ricky, thank you so much for joining me today. I'm super excited to have you on. Yeah, thanks. I am too. This is my very favorite topic. I think I could talk about it all day. Yeah, I stumbled on your Instagram after I read a book on attachment theory. And I was just so intrigued with the whole theory itself because it resonated with me. And I know that there's going to be so many people listening that don't even know what attachment theory is. So first, let's just start out with what is attachment theory? And what what are the different attachment styles? Awesome. That's a good place to start. So um, this theory came about in like the 60s. It's been around for a really long time. Um, There's a psychologist named John Bowlby. And he noticed that the way that infants related to their parents um, he thought this might give us a clue into how people, how people like manage their adult relationships. So he did a test. Um, it's called a strange situation test. Um, I know you mentioned in our emails back and forth that you like looking at those studies. So I thought you would like this one. Um, in the strange situation test, they put an infant and their mother in a research room with a one way mirror so that the, the researchers can see them, but they can't see that they're being observed. And they put a stranger seated in the room too. Just a regular person, not someone who looked creepy, but just someone who's not someone that the infant knows, right? Um, So there were uh, four different ways that the infants responded to this experiment. So this is what they, they told the mother, bring your infant into the room. The room's filled with toys, right? And we're just gonna observe how they react in that room. So so the first the first infants um let's say the secure attachers, this is 50% of the population reacts this way. When the secure attachment folks, when they're infants and they're brought into the room, they enter this, this research room full of toys. And these infants, they explore all the toys. Um, the researchers tell the mother after a few minutes to quietly leave the room and leave the infant behind in the room, right? When I say infant, I mean like 12 months to 18 months. So the secure attachers they'll be exploring the toys, but when they notice that their mother's gone, they freak out, right? Like I'm in this room with a stranger. I'm searching for my mother. I'm crying for her. When the mother comes back into the room, they're like, oh, okay, everything's cool again. And they keep playing with the toys. Those are your secure attachers. The other 50% of the population is, those are my people. These are the insecure attachers, almost perfectly divided between um, anxious attachers and avoidant attachers. Um, so my area of expertise is the anxious attachers. Um, when these infants were brought into the room, they don't really play with toys. They might hesitantly check the toys out, but they're going to kind of stick close to mom. They notice when she leaves because they've been sticking by her. They absolutely panic. And when she comes back into that room, they're, they're like death grip on their mom's leg, right? Um, the avoidant attachers, those infants are brought into the room. They won't play with the toys, but they also don't cling to their mom. They kind of just sit looking freaked out. Uh, when she leaves, they're, they look perfectly normal, but inside there's like a storm raging. They are activated and upset, but they either don't notice it or they don't feel it. And when she comes back in, they also don't seem to care. These kids look very disconnected. Um, Another, a fourth type that I don't like to talk about much because it's only 5% of the population. Those kids are combination and that usually comes from like really great trauma. Um, It's so sad. These are the fearful avoidance they're called. And I know everybody tries to diagnose themselves as a fearful avoidant when they see pieces of both the anxious and the avoidant that they relate to. But the fearful avoidant kids um, won't play with toys. They won't touch their mother. She leaves, they freak out just like the anxious folks. But when she comes back, they won't touch her either because there's no trust there. 
but let's not talk about that one. That's a whole nother topic. Um, our topic so today is going to be, isn't it crazy? I love yeah. reading that study. It's so wild. So it sounds like from what I'm hearing, you have the main ones, the main components are you have the anxious, the avoidant, and the secure. So I guess my question to you would be, is this stemming from childhood or is this something that's more learned behavior as the person navigates relationships and navigates life as they get older? Or is it a combination of both? Sure. There are um, different, different ideas on that. I think there are definitely some psychologists who say, no, this is just childhood, right? However you responded to, to your mother's or father's attention to you or how well they responded to your needs, that sets that in stone and you're doomed for the, you know, there are psychologists who think that, but there are also a lot who think that maybe we pick up some of our ideas on how safe the world is, um, in our early dating life or our young adult relationships. Um, but from everything I've read, it's not totally determined whether or not, um, it's nature or nurture on that one. Um, I think I tend to think that it's a little bit of both because I know um, I've always been kind of an anxious person, but when I, uh, but I, for me, I feel like it was tumultuous adult and young adult relationships that really set me on an anxious path. So what got Um, you started into this field? So you mentioned that you're more of the anxious type. So did you go through things when you were younger or throughout your dating life? What really got you into this field in the first place? Yeah. Um, well, I gotta say when I was a teenager and a young adult, I definitely functioned very anxiously in my relationships. I was a people pleaser. I definitely wanted to keep my partner happy and choosing me at all costs. Um, even if that cost was my happiness. Um, I noticed that stuff now when I look back, when I was in it, I didn't know what I was doing wrong or why the relationships were all so hard. Um, But the thing that introduced me to attachment theory, I love psychology and I've always read up on it just for fun, but uh, I I got divorced and I was like, I I I put this in my book Um, after like a breakup, just a relationship breakup with boyfriend and girlfriend. It's easy to go, ah, they were whatever. That's fine. On to the next one. Right. But when you get divorced, that's like a real come to Jesus moment where you sit down and you go, holy cow, I need to figure out exactly what I did to contribute to this and not because I don't want this ever happening again. So that's what started a lot of research for me. I stumbled upon attachment theory and um, just everything was clicking. Everything. I even showed it to my ex-husband after we split up and he was like, holy cow, that's us. That's what happened. Like it clicked for him too. So was, I love that because I went through and similar. I, I went through a yeah. divorce. I actually went through a breakup mm-hmm. even after my divorce. That was very traumatic. Mm-hmm. And I had to really look back and I wanted to grow. So I, I think, you yeah. know, and I always tell my clients that growth happens when you can learn the lessons that need to be learned. You have to learn about yourself. Yeah. Otherwise, you're not going to grow. And when I started exactly. reading... You'll repeat the patterns again. You know exactly, and when I started reading on attachment theory, same with with me, it was like a light bulb went off. I'm like, oh my god, mm-hmm. this is me. And I definitely feel yeah. like, at least when my in my younger days, I fell more on the anxious side. So for those that are listening, what is anxious attachment theory? What can somebody look for? How do they know if they fall more on the anxious side? Oh, awesome. or yeah. Anxious? We maybe should have started out with that. I feel like we're a little ahead of ourselves here. Um, That's so okay. That's if, okay. Yeah. If yeah. you are an anxious attacher, you are going to feel like nobody that you're in a relationship will ever get close enough to you. You'll feel like you're constantly chasing them, that they're running away. Um, you might feel like the things that you want and need are too much. Um you might have had partners call you high maintenance before. That's an that's a an indicator of that too. Um, an anxious attachment. It seems like you only feel comfortable when your partner is like on you. Like if if they're hanging out with you, making time, and they're in your space, you feel comfortable. But the moment they leave your side, if that anxiety starts building, and you're wondering when are they going to see me again, you might be an anxious attacher. I feel like that was 100% me when I was younger. And I still exhibit some of those behaviors 
And one thing I was reading about was activated attachment system. So I found that really interesting. So what does that mean, especially if you're an anxious type and how do you recognize when your attachment system is being activated? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So I'm going to take it back to the, to infancy again, right? So you've got a baby and it's laying in a crib and it notices that it has a need. Maybe it feels hungry um, or maybe it's afraid and it needs some comfort, right? So the baby in that crib um, doesn't have like conscious thoughts. It's a baby, but its brain is going to go, I notice that I have a need. I'm going to cry out because every time I cry out, something good happens, right? My mom comes and comforts me. Um, That's our attachment system. That's the attachment system in play. Um, when we feel a need that we have and our, and our body and brain feels compelled to do something about it to make us feel safe. Um, so on the anxious side, when we feel our activated attachment system, that's our body and brain saying, I feel that I have a need for closeness. We act out to try to make that happen. Um, sometimes our acting out is to over contact someone. That's when you send 30 text messages or you're calling them too much, right? That's, I mean, we might as well be babies in a crib crying out for, for our, our security blanket to come back and comfort us. Um, interestingly, on the avoidance side, their attachment system gets activated when they feel too much closeness. Um, their safety and security is in independence and they, they tend to find themselves coming down to calm when they're alone. Um, and of course, those are the folks that the, anxious people date <laughs> like more a lot of time. I yeah. can definitely mm-hmm. relate to so that we, one. <laughs> oh yeah. 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 Um, and we can get into why that is later, but, um, definitely, uh, if you're a secure attacher, you're more likely to feel that need rising in you for closeness and support and be able to say, Oh, I'm feeling a little lonely right now. I'm feeling a little unfulfilled maybe I will work on that passion project that I have. Maybe I will call a friend, right? A secure attacher has lots of different tools in order to make themselves feel safe and secure. To where an anxious and avoidant attacher, they are looking at the object of their affection as the problem and the solution. And then they're, so, they're not drawing from other places. You know, the first thing that comes to mind when you talk about that, especially for an anxious, is sex. I, I almost that's wonder that's if true. people yeah. who are anxious will use sex as a mechanism of getting close to their partner. Have you ever seen yeah. that with people that you worked with? Oh, absolutely. There's um one of the, it's a fantastic book that I read and they were talking about something called um, solace sex, solace. And that's um, using sex as a means of bringing someone closer to you to calm yourself down. It's not healthy. (laughs) But I think a lot of the times people don't even notice that they're doing that. Um, Sometimes you'll see folks with like really massive libidos and they don't necessarily, it's not necessarily a super high sex drive. It's more likely a means for calming themselves down through sex. Oh, wow. Yeah. That, that right there, it's, it's so powerful when you think about it, especially for the anxious types or have an attachment, yeah. you know, style that's more anxious, if you're mm-hmm. using sex as a means of getting close to somebody, and I can almost guarantee you that afterwards, it's almost like a feeling of, of a void, or yeah, yeah, absolutely. I've been there, I've, been there. Right. I've, I've done oh, yeah. that. And I, oh, yeah. you know, yeah. use sex as a means of getting close to someone. And then afterwards, I'm like, why did I do that? I regret it, because yeah. it just didn't help at all. It wasn't a healthy coping mechanism. And totally. so that really resonates so much. So Mm -hmm. what are some triggers or like, are there certain triggers for the anxious that triggers that attack? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Any sign, any slightest hint of abandonment is going to set off um, an anxious attachers, um, um, like the alarm system, our attachment system, right? We are hypervigilant, meaning we're always on the lookout for abandonment. So I remember at my most anxious, I would feel like if my significant other, from the moment they left, it was almost like pressure was building up. Like, like right when they left, it was fine. But then like five minutes, 10 minutes, one hour, five hours. And the longer they were gone, the louder those alarm systems in my head would feel like bring them back, get them close again. 
I don't, I don't do that anymore, but it took a lot of work. It took a lot of work to be able to tell myself, look, they're not leaving you forever. But that's, that's what an anxious attacher at their worst is going to feel the longer their significant other is out of contact or let's see signs of abandonment would also be maybe like if your partner's phone is buzzing in their pocket, you're an anxious brain might say that's definitely somebody else that they're interested in. Um, I guess you could probably think of lots of examples from your own life too. If you leaned anxious, it's anything that's going to make you start sweating and worry that your partner is thinking about or going to leave you. And it reminds me of what you were talking about in the beginning of that study that was done with the babies. Like that's what I think about Mm -hmm. where the mom's leaving the room and the baby's Mm -hmm. like, where's my mom? Where's my mom? Where's my mom? And I'm not going to feel better until she comes back. And it's like almost the same. When's he coming back? Or when is she coming back? You know, whatever the Mm -hmm. case may be. But it reminds me of that. And I, yeah, man, I've been there because especially in my younger days, I used to have those types of anxious behaviors and it triggered that abandonment. And I didn't feel better until that person was either with me. I found this comforting when I was studying this and your listeners might too. There's a reason that those alarm bells feel like life or death. Um, because for an infant, think of like cave days too, right? If you're, if you're following your mother around and you're a little helpless child and you lose sight of her and if she can't find you, you're dead. You know, like the stakes were, are very high for an infant that can't reconnect with their mother. They will literally die. So that's our, that's our wiring in our brain. That's why it feels like a life or death kind of thing that like, you'll be telling your brain, like, don't text them again. This is a terrible idea. And then you do it anyway. Um, because the stakes feel a lot higher in your brain than they actually are. So it makes me wonder about if biology is influencing dependency, because there was a study Mm -hmm. by James Cone at the university of Virginia And they scanned MRIs, uh, they scanned women's brains with an MRI. Mm -hmm. And it showed that when they had induced stress, that they would induce the stress in these women. And it Mm -hmm. would show that the hypothalamus would light up when they had the stress component that was added. But when they brought their husbands into the picture and their husbands were consoling them, these areas of the brain didn't light up. So... The question was then, is biology influencing the dependency? Is it okay to just be, maybe we're human and we have these natural dependencies or is it that nature versus nurture of learned behavior? So it's it's really interesting. And I, I don't think that, I think it's very subjective to answer this. Maybe we don't know for sure, but it almost makes me wonder if it's just something in our biology that we naturally as humans need that dependency. We, we want to feel comforted. And why is it that some more than others have this type of behavior and some are secure and are fine? Yeah. Well, I think there's, um, I think it's a balanced thing, right? We are not, we're social creatures and we're not meant to have to completely self-soothe. Um, that's why solitary confinement is such a terrible punishment. You know, humans yes. are not meant to, if we feel very, very stressed out and activated, we're supposed to call upon our tribe and our group or our significant other or our family unit to make us feel better. That's okay. But on the um, extreme end of that, if you can't comfort yourself at all, then it's almost like your partner is a lifeboat. And it's like trying to save someone who can't swim, right? They're going to pull you down under the water with them. So I think we need a healthy amount of relying on our tribe and our significant other. And we also need to be able to self-soothe, especially in situations where for example, the texting thing, if my significant other is at work, right, and he's gone for eight hours, I need to be able to have a calm, regulated system for a very reasonable amount of time for him to be away from me. If I don't, that's a problem. You know, that's me being somebody drowning who can't swim. Because because you shouldn't need to have somebody text you throughout the day in order for you to feel like they're with you, you know, so it's it's balanced. Absolutely. Yeah. And I like that you brought up the solitude because I used to work in the prison mm-hmm. system a couple of years ago. I've talked oh. about this on a previous episode. Yeah. And, and working yeah. in the federal prison system was eye opening because I really saw the psychology behind when people are alone, when they're in solitary confinement, how they act around others. And it really made me realize that we are human creatures that need to be around people. 
We do. We do. It's yep. part of our biology. It's part of who we are. If you go back thousands and thousands of years, you know, just even as um, human evolution, you know, developed, we are social mm-hmm. creatures. We depend on others. You know, we naturally right. be around other people. So I, 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 I agree. And I think that it's partly biology. And I think that it's also maybe mm-hmm. nature versus nurture as well. But self-regulation, I think is the key word that you said is really being able to self-regulate yeah. your emotions. And you mentioned mm-hmm. earlier that avoidance tend to attract or anxious tend to attract avoidance. So we is do. there a reason yeah. for that? And what are some yeah. re- flags and maybe some red flags to look out for when an anxious is in the dating realm or in relationships? Sure. Okay. First, this is one of my favorites. Um, the popular literature calls this the anxious avoidant trap. This is why these two are drawn to each other. Um, so to an anxious attacher, the world looks like a place that is not going to meet our needs. It looks like a world where there's lots of things that we want, but we can't get them, right? Meaning closeness and affection and sex and reassurance. So that's our worldview. The world is a place that's not meeting my needs. So when we go out in the dating realm and we're sitting down across from a secure person who's going, you're wonderful. I would like to take you out again. I think you're so great. You know, they're, they're throwing that reassurance and love out at you. Your brain goes, this feels wrong. It, it might, there's no activated attachment system. You might feel bored, right? Like you might feel like that person's too desperate, right? Like, why do they like me? I haven't even done anything to earn this. Um, I know that for me, I can think back on lots of dates that I was on where I was just bored to tears or I thought, oh, he sounds super desperate. I'm not calling him back. <laughs> um, yeah. Because he was not affirming my worldview. That the world's a place that doesn't meet my needs. And if love is real, I need to pursue it, right? Um, the avoidant attachers are on the other side of the spectrum. In their worldview, the world is a place that needs too much from them. So when they sit across the table from a secure attacher who's going, oh, you're going away next weekend? That's awesome. Have fun, right? When they leave them alone the entire weekend, they're going, this person doesn't want very much of me. That doesn't affirm my worldview that the world wants too much for me. They must not like me very much. And then they don't feel that spark of attraction. But then you put an anxious and an avoidant attacher across the table from each other on a date. And there's the attachment person with stars in their eyes going, Oh my gosh, you're so great. Can I see you tomorrow and the day after that? And the avoidant attacher is going, Oh, this is like somebody who wants way too much from me. They must really like me. This feels safe. Um, and, and that starts the pursuer distance or cat and mouse kind of back and forth between them. But it, like I said, there's the anxious attacher feeling affirmed that person's running away from them. They're going, that feels like love to me. And the avoidant attacher saying, this person's chasing me. They must love me. They're both really toxic, unhealthy thoughts, but it's super common. I guarantee you somewhere out in the world, there is an anxious and avoidant on a date right now, engaging in the push pull and feeling the sparks flying. I think what stands out to me is when you said that when an anxious attachment gets activated or, you know, you get used to that being activated and that's what you're used to, right? You go through life and relationships navigating and you're used to that attachment being activated and then you meet someone secure it's not being activated all of a sudden Mm -hmm. and it feels wrong it it feels it it sure doesn't feel like love that's for sure yeah it feels boring too normal this is too Mm -hmm. boring and this is too normal there's there's no excitement in this i'm not being activated what's wrong because it's almost Mm -hmm. like being activated becomes your new normal. So when it's not being activated, it feels wrong. That is mind blowing to me. It's like, light yeah, bulb. isn't that crazy? <laughs> it, it makes so um, much sense. Right. So, so you asked about green flags and red flags. I think um, it's important, no matter what your attachment style is, um, to learn what your triggers are. You need to learn what it feels like to have an activated attachment system and to recognize it. You don't just follow it blindly because that's what we've been doing, right? You recognize it and you, and you say, okay, I recognize this. I, they said that this would happen. I don't have to believe it and I don't have to follow it. And that's really powerful. If you're sitting across the table from somebody who's saying, well, this is great. I'd love to take you out again in a couple days. Would that be okay? And your brain's going, oh, this is boring. 
you should go, wait a minute, this is my, this is my attachment system not activating. Maybe this person is a better bet than I think. Maybe I should just push through and, and actually let them take me out again. An avoidant person, much harder for them, I think. Um, when they're looking at somebody who's giving them the freedom to go away for a weekend, they need to say, I need to not assume that this person is rejecting me. And I need to go, whoa, this person's giving me the, the space that I've been asking everyone for. Maybe this is a safer situation than I think. It's tough. It's really tough. And it's, I, I shouldn't say it like it's so simple. It's truly not. I've been, I've been studying and working on myself with this stuff for years. And I still find myself believing my anxious thoughts every now and then. So as an anxious, if I'm on a date and mm -hmm. I'm really interested in this person, how can I recognize, or even maybe a couple dates in, how do I recognize mm -hmm. when somebody might be avoidant and some of those flags that is probably not the best for my attachment system or for me as a person, if I know I'm an anxious, what are some things to avoid? Yeah. That's a wonderful question. Um, the thing that we have to do, and this is in all kinds of books that I've read, uh, we have to learn to notice when things feel off or uncomfortable. Um, a spark of attraction can also be something feeling off. We have to like take notice. Um, meditation is great for this. Notice what it feels like to have a calm system and notice what it feels like to be activated. Um, when you're sitting across from someone on a date, you need to notice activation and try not to act on it, but just try to notice it and not make any moves until you can figure that out. That's someone who's very anxious. Um, if you're just a little anxious, it's probably a good idea to be aware of it, but you can be a little bit freer with your actions. But if you're, if you're severely anxious or avoidant, you've got all kinds of problems in dating. Um, it's best to just slow down, slow down, notice what your body's telling you. The feeling of panic when someone's not calling you back and not being reassuring is yes, you need to work on reassuring yourself, but you also need to notice that that might not be a great person for you, right? Um, a secure attacher is not going to be setting off our alarm system all the time. So uh, that'd be the ideal, obviously, is to find somebody who doesn't set us off constantly um, and to work on ourselves also in the process. Learn to withstand more time alone. Learn to reassure yourself. Learn to build up your support system around you so that you don't need that person's phone call to make your day okay. And so what about boundary setting? How can the anxious set better boundaries when they are recognizing that, okay, hey, this person may not be the best for me, or if they're, you know, sitting across from an avoidant, maybe who yeah. they're recognizing, okay, I'm starting to recognize that my attachment system is being activated. How can I now set boundaries to distance myself or to put myself in a better situation? Yeah, I have to say, I, I want to put this out there because I think there's going to be a lot of people listening to this going for one, they don't know what boundaries are, right? It's really shocking how few people like understand what, what good healthy boundaries really are. But for two, even if you do understand healthy boundaries, I think that's the hardest thing to set. Um, in my entire journey, anyway, setting healthy boundaries for myself and the people around me has been the most difficult part. So I, I hesitate to just offer up a bullet, a bulleted list, which is what I do on my Instagram anyway. But I want people to know that boundary setting takes just an absolute ton of practice. Um, for me, in the very beginning, when I was learning what boundaries were and what I wanted for myself, it helped, it helped me to hold myself accountable. I would actually write down my list of boundaries and I saw myself breaking them all the time. But just to write them down and see them and know this is who I want to be. This is what I'm working on. Um, that helped. For example, um, I had a goal to not over contact the person that I was dating, right? So when they would leave, I would, I would have a note to myself, do not text, like do not text. I would end up breaking it sometimes, but the more that I would look at that and I would say, this is who I want to be. It's not that I'm stuffing my needs down and just like, yeah, when they text, they text, I'll just take my breadcrumbs and eat them happily. It's not like that. 
But I said, I have a goal to not be someone who's over contacting my person. And so it's my goal and I, it would help me stick to it a little bit. Another thing about boundaries too, is that uh, boundaries aren't just things that keep bad behavior out. They're also bound. Boundaries can also bring good behavior in, right? Like a boundary would be, I'm not going to continue dating someone who only contacts me once a week. That would be a boundary. I know that I need more contact than that to feel happy in a relationship. So that's another thing you could write down for yourself. In order for me to be happy in a relationship, I need someone who regularly and of their own volition contacts me mm, at least three times a week or, or even more. People also, another question I get on the Instagram account all the time is how much is too much, right? They think there's some magic number. Like, like I want to see my partner six days a week. Is that too much? And I was like, is that what you want? And I, well, I, I think that's what and it's like, no, that's not a wishy washy question. We decide what we want. All our needs are okay, right? If you want to see your partner seven days a week, there are people out there who want to see their partner seven days a week. Um, at that point, it becomes an issue of compatibility. So when you're setting your boundaries, decide what you want. When you write it down, if it sounds crazy to you, adjust it, right? But if it sounds like something that would feel good, run with it and um, try to stick to it. And don't beat yourself up if you can't stick to it because man, that's tough in the beginning. It's still tough, but <laughs> it's easier it than is. when I started. Yeah. It, and I, I love what you said about boundaries because boundaries are not always for the other person. The boundaries are for yourself. Right. And yeah. if you yeah. can't set those boundaries, you can't be the best version of yourself for those that are around you. you got to get comfortable with it because boundary setting exactly. is, it's a skill. It is not easy. It's a skill. You're like used to people pleasing and you're used to yeah. trying to accommodate other people. And another thing that I like what you said is, you know, really just asking yourself, well, what is it that you want? And I think communication yeah. is a really big part of it because what I've noticed with my clients over the years and even with myself, especially when I was younger, mm -hmm. is I would always hesitate to communicate very clearly with my potential partner, whoever it was, what I was dating, whether yes. it was because I was afraid of rejection, I was afraid of what they would say that they maybe wouldn't feel the same way back or that I would be too clingy. And I used to have yeah. this type of behavior where I'm like, well, I'm going to make a post and hope that they see it. And so oh, have no. you ever noticed yeah, that's that the with thing. your clients? And, and I think it's, I, from what I've read, it's called yeah. protest behavior. So is that something that anxious mm -hmm. attachment style people will do more of to try to get the attention of someone? Oh, or yeah. how would you, what would be your best advice in terms of how to communicate if you are more of an anxious person? Yeah, sure. Um, so for any insecure attacher, um, direct assertive communication is really hard because there's a lot at stake and we don't deal with rejection well as insecure attachers. Um, when we feel activated, protest behaviors are what we use to try to bring our partners close. They're not healthy. They're any unhealthy way that we use to bring our partners close. This would be making a post on your social media, hoping that they see it. This would be making a sarcastic comment, hoping that they read between the lines. This is maybe you guys are making dinner and you're stomping around being huffy instead of, instead of telling them what's bothering you. This could also be giving them the silent treatment, hoping that they ask what's wrong. Um, yeah, any of these protest behaviors, we use them to try to bring people closer, but it does the exact opposite. So learning what protest behaviors are and trying to squash those in yourself, because that's your job, not your partner's job. It's your job to, to not be acting like an angry child, right? When, when you're upset, I think of the baby in the crib. I'm not saying that to be mean. I do it too. What are some ways that if you are someone who is anxious that you can better communicate with your partner or with your spouse, especially if it's oh, like a yeah. conflict resolution, you know, if there's a yeah, conflict, absolutely. how do we talk to our spouse if we're anxious and we're feeling our attachment system being activated? Totally. Um, so I, I say this in my book, um, education about communication. And I know that that's not sexy at all in the least, but learning how to become a better communicator um, my favorite book for this is called Difficult Conversations. Um, and I, I link to it occasionally on my Instagram page because I think it's such an important book and books like it. Uh, it talks about the difference between you've got aggressive communication, which is someone like yelling about their needs or, you know, like, this is what I want. This is what I need. There's passive communication where we just kind of retreat into ourselves and hope that somebody notices. 
Um, there's passive aggressive, which this is when we're making sarcastic comments or it's things that we're doing that seem kind of aggressive, but it's kind of under the fly under the radar. Um, and the antidote to all of that is called assertive communication. And this is where we, we bravely sit someone down and we say, look, this is how I'm feeling. This is what I need. And I am not saying that like it's easy. That's another thing. Boundaries and assertive communication are the remedy to all of this stuff, but they're so hard to learn, but it's possible. You just, you do have to be motivated. You have to educate yourself and you have to practice them and they're scary, but they get easier the the more that we do them. Learning how your attachment system is triggered, communication make a huge, huge difference, especially moving forward in dating and relationships. So Mm -hmm. we talk a lot about the anxious, but can somebody be both anxious and secure? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, for example, um, if I were to take an attachment theory test right now, I test predominantly secure. Um, But I also have my anxious leanings. It's hard to get rid of that stuff completely considering it's kind of a little bit wired when we're children, right? Um, I test predominantly secure, but I have anxious leanings. That means when the stakes are high or I get really stressed out, my behavior is going to look more anxious. Um, someone can be secure with avoidant leanings. They're going to be pretty secure, but when, when, um, when the stuff hits the fan, they're going to need to retreat to a room and be alone in order to regulate. Um, and then there's also people who are purely anxious. There's people who are purely avoidant. That's so mean. And we can move ourselves along that scale with work, you know? I feel like I, I said this earlier, I was super anxious when I was young. I look back at the shit mm-hmm. that I did in relationships and I'm like, what the hell was I doing? I would send paragraphs. <laughs> I don't even yeah. want to tell some of the stories of, you know, my behavior. Oh no, I, 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 my lips are embarrassing. <laughs> Yeah, I've sent the walls of text. I don't know what you're doing, but I, where are you? And I, yeah, I've done that. (laughs) And, you know, I'm to the point now where I'm like, I I definitely think I'm more secure, but there are times when that anxious, you know, attachment system is triggered. And so for me, what I've done, um, at least now I'm 36, of course, I've, you know, grown a lot, but sometimes I'll write, I'll write it out. So I have found that like, if I'm feeling a certain way, I will write it out. Mm -hmm. I will wait to, you know, send it and then kind of wait until I'm calm a little bit. And then nine times out of 10, I end up not sending it or, you know, shortening it a lot. And especially now that I'm older, I'm very just upfront with how I'm feeling my expectations. I have found that it saves me a lot of time. I'm just very Mm -hmm. forward. Hey, this is what I'm looking for. Or, you know, this is my expectations and dating or Hey, I'm not really, Mm -hmm. I, I prefer when somebody reaches out to me I don't like when someone's like going a week without talking to me. That's just not the style that I have with relationships. I have found that being straightforward, it not only eases my attachment system when it's triggered, it it makes me feel empowered because I'm like, no, I'm who I am. And when you start feeling that way and when you start sticking to your true self, I find that it makes you more secure because it's that empowerment. Oh, for sure. For sure. It does. That's the nice thing too, for anybody listening who's going, Oh crap, I'm super anxious. That's me. Um, keeping little promises with yourself, treating yourself like, like the things that you want do matter. It builds trust over time. And that's the thing that moves us towards secure attachment. Um, and like what you were saying too, a secure attacher is not going to be interested in someone who's not calling them back after a week. They're going to lose interest. Um, so we have to notice when, when people are doing things that hurt us. And we have to decide, I don't want that for myself. I'm uninterested in that. And that moves us towards secure too. We move, we move farther toward the insecure um, end of the spectrum when we betray ourselves and we allow someone to have power over us who's acting in ways that set us off and don't feel good over and over again. Right, right. And especially congrats to you building your security. That's awesome. Yeah. and, And, you know, for those listening, like, let's say you're in a situation now. And, um, and I'm sure Ricky can jump in on this, but let's say you're listening and you really, really like a guy, but he's not calling you back or maybe he's, you know, wishy washy and you're hesitant to Mm -hmm. say anything. You're like, you know what? I'm just not going to call him, even though I'm super anxious and I'm checking his social media and I'm checking my messages Mm -hmm. all the time to see if he calls. Just say something. Just say something because if he comes back or she 
if they come back and say, Mm -hmm. you know, I'm not interested, or maybe they don't give you the response that you're looking for, well, you have your answer. And then that way it's information. Yes. You're not as anxious and you can either choose to Mm -hmm. continue or you can choose to move on because if you know you have more of an anxious style, that's okay. It's just Mm -hmm. noticing those things and learning about yourself and then how to have better coping mechanisms moving forward. That's kind of what I've gotten from everything that you've said. Would you say that that's accurate? Absolutely. Um, My anxious impulses will probably never go away. I will probably always feel a little bit nervous if if it's been a day or two and my significant other has not called me. I'm going to feel a little bit nervous. But the difference between being an insecure and a secure attacher is what we do about that, right? Um, Mm -hmm. Same. Instead of instead of freaking out and sweating and composing big paragraphs of text now, I will say I'm using this as an opportunity to recognize that I'm not putting enough good energy into my own life. Maybe this is when I should start typing away on my book. Maybe I should call my mom. I haven't called her in a little while. Maybe I should take my dog for a walk. Um, a secure attacher is going to find ways to make their life fulfilling without hyper focusing on the ways that their relationship's not doing it for them. And they're not going to put up with it if the if those kind of behaviors are happening to them a lot. Right. So I know we focused a lot on the anxious and that's kind of your niche. But mm-hmm. what about somebody who has more of an avoidant attachment style? Because I know there's probably listeners that right now are like, I feel like I'm more of an avoidant. So if sure. there is somebody who has an avoidant attachment style, what are some things that they can do when they're navigating relationships or if there's resources that are available for them? Because mm-hmm. if they're recognizing the fact that, okay, I tend to not be the one that calls. I tend to be the one who needs my space. What are some coping strategies that they can do when they're in a relationship? Awesome. That's a great question. And um, there are more avoidance in the population than there are anxious attachers. So I'll bet some of the listeners are going, oh, that's not really me, but that's my partner. I'm, maybe I'm the other side of this. Um, education about avoidant attachment is the most important thing. Um, My very good friend runs the Instagram account, The Loving Avoidant. And you can find out some awesome information on there. Uh, Those will be posts that you'll read and you'll go, Oh my gosh, that's me. But um, that account also addresses what to do about it. Um, There's a Patreon connected to that account too that puts out an article once a month that's fantastic for avoidant attachers too. Um, I think... Educating yourself about what you need to do about your avoidance and sticking to the very uncomfortable advice that, um, that they're going to give about what to do about it. I I would give that advice to an anxious attacher too. The things that we need to do to work through our attachment, uh, trauma and, and discomfort, they don't feel good. They're, they feel hard and they're not natural, but, um, We need to learn what it feels like when we're acting in these ways. And we need to commit to the very uncomfortable process of working through them, practicing being the way that we want to be and sticking with it. Yeah, growth is hard. It's never easy. It is uncomfortable because you're facing the things that you have been used to doing for probably years, maybe from infancy. (laughs) Growth is hard. And I I almost feel bad for some of the secure attachment people out there because they're literally like the, the the positive old blood types. Everybody loves yeah. them. Like everybody, you know, can be with the secure, you know? And so it's like mm-hmm. these secure people have to navigate the dating realm of... Yeah. And they have to put up with all of us who are freaking out about everything. And nah, they, there's a lot of wonderful secure attachers out there, though, who say like, I care about this person. I see them struggling and I really want to help them with it. So what's your best advice for anyone listening who is struggling with communication or relationships in their life and are just trying to figure out their attachment style for the first time? If you had one good piece of advice to give, what would you say? Hmm. I think being able to identify yourself and your attachment style is hugely helpful. Um, There's a website I really like called yourpersonality.net. I'm not sure who runs that website, just as a disclaimer. But the questions that they ask are fantastic. And it will identify you on a spectrum instead of just spitting out an internet type. You are this. You are this, right? Yourpersonality.net is going to show you where you are on the spectrum. 
And it's, you can log in, save your results so that you can retest in a year after you've been doing work and see if you're moving yourself closer to security. And for those listening, we will link that on the podcast and we'll link that on the website as well. And I know that there's a lot of people listening to this podcast that want more resources and they want to learn more about this. I know you have a book that's out. So where can people find you? Um, where yeah. can people find- <laughs> what a perfect transition too. Um, because um, my book actually, within my book, I list at least 30 sources that helped me through my anxious attachment. Um, I've read over 60 books on the topic, but I picked my favorite ones and I put them into my book for anxious attachers who want more. Um, anxiousheartsguide.com is where people can go to to purchase the, the book that I wrote on anxious attachment and how to overcome it. Um, and the book's filled with resources on how to get more if they want more information beyond that. Awesome. And I'm going to link everything. So for those of you that are awesome. listening and that want to follow Ricky, want to buy her book, please, please get her book because she is a wealth of knowledge on this subject. And I promise you that when you start to really do your research and educate yourself on attachment theory, it will change your life, especially with your relationships and how you navigate people around you. So Ricky, thank you. Thank you so much. I'm so humbled. And this was awesome because I learned so, so much. So I'm so grateful for you being on the show. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for having me. I think we really packed a lot into that hour. Absolutely. And so for everyone listening, again, I'm going to link everything down below. And uh, until the next time, see you on the next episode of Diary of an Empath.